Hi everyone. So, um, as usual, I'm Dr. Sam Hurst, and you can uh, find me on Twitter at Romgoth Sam and use the hashtag Romance in the Gothic to talk about any of the classes. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the 18th century Gothic. It's a little bit of a misnomer because we are going to be going into the early 19th century, but um, I'm going to sort of be predominantly focusing on that period from the sort of last 30 years of uh, the 18th century and the development of the Gothic within that period, because the 1790s are really sort of the heyday and efflorescence of the Gothic um, in the British and Irish context, particularly the British context. So before we get started, I've got a little quiz. Um, I'm going to stop recording once we've asked the questions and it's going to be the opportunity to just shout out um, the answers. I'm, I'm fairly sure that most of you will know some of these, but we'll see. So the first question on the quiz, when was the first Gothic novel published? When was the broad period, sort of circa, um, of the early British Gothic? Which of these texts count as that early British Gothic or early British and Irish Gothic? Mysteries of Udolpho, Dracula, Frankenstein, Wuthering Heights, The Monk. Um, and then Northanger Abbey was the first Gothic parody, true or false? And which other national traditions strongly influenced the British Gothic? So I'm going to stop recording. So um, if you are watching this video, stop, pause, give yourself a chance to think and come back and I'll give you the answers in a minute. So the first Gothic novel was, of course, The Castle of Otranto by Horace Walpole, published in 1764. The broad period of the early British Gothic ranges from about 1764 to, and the end point is more contested. We can think of 1820 as a key date, which was the publication of the last really popular bestseller of that early Gothic period, um, Melmoth the Wanderer by Charles Maturin. I personally like to extend it out to sort of the early 1830s, and I think 1831 is a good date to go to the publication of the second edition of Frankenstein. Um, this is not sort of the heyday of the Gothic, but you're still getting productions in a very similar vein. Um, the, the texts that count as early Gothic are, of course, Mysteries of Udolpho, The Monk, and Frankenstein. Frankenstein just in at the cusp, 1819. Um, Wuthering Heights um, from the 1840s uh, is slightly outside of that period, wor working into the Victorian Gothic, slightly in the middle of the two, uh, perched. Um, between uh, these two kind of uh, popular, popular periods of the Gothic. And Dracula, of course, is much later, late Victorian, um, fin de siècle Gothic. Northanger Abbey was the first Gothic parody, true or false? False, it was a Gothic parody, of course, but it was far from being the first, and we'll look at some examples of that later. Um, and other national traditions that strongly influenced the British Gothic. So there was a lot of cross-pollination with the Irish Gothic um, and writers like Charles Maturin, Theoreticians like Edmund Burke, other figures, uh, some very popular writing figures like Regina Marie Roche were Irish. Um, and there's a lot of sort of uh, a mingling of traditions going on. <coughs> um, you also have the German Schauermann and the Sturm und Drang novels, uh, well, Sturm und Drang productions that um, influenced the uh, British Gothic and the French, sort of particularly the French anti-clerical propaganda in the wake of the French Revolution. So let's go back to the beginning and discuss sort of the rise of the Gothic, where it comes from and how we can identify it. So I thought today we'd start with a little bit of a prehistory of the Gothic because when we focus too much on the castle of Otranto, it seems to some extent like the Gothic's coming out of nowhere um, the sole brainchild of Horace Walpole, with no sort of links to anything else that was going on or had been going on. Now, these texts here are not Gothic per se. Um, obviously, they're from a much earlier period. You're looking at the end of the 16th, beginning of the, the 17th century for these texts. Um, but they were self-consciously interacted with by the Gothic. And we can already see some of the key um, ideas and images that get reused in the Gothic in some of these plays. So Hamlet is a really key text. It's referenced by Walpole. Um, and you also see that figure of the ghost and the ambiguous father's ghost, particularly becoming a feature of later 
um, Gothic novels. And there is this um, interaction with Shakespeare, particularly in the 18th century by 18 Goth 18th century Gothic writers as, um, as a model or an inspiration for their Gothic work. Um, Titus Andronicus is another sort of interesting bit of sort of prehistory of the Gothic, um, in part because of the sort of terrible horrors of the Renaissance revenge tragedy um, on the stage. You know, you've got cannibalism, you've got uh, despair, you've got murder, you've got betrayal, you've got sexual assault. You've got all of these horrors on stage, which became sort of part of the apparatus of the later Gothic, um, particularly sort of the, what we think of as the horror novel. But you also have here a precursor of this interesting sort of re-evaluation and, and interaction with the term and concept of Gothic. Um, so in Titus Andronicus, uh, some of the major characters are Goths um, in ancient Rome. And if you're looking back to the 18th century and this use of the term Gothic, it, it's a term that has become quite fluid and redeployed in different ways. So if you're reading novels from the period, you might find the term Gothic deployed just to more broadly refer to the medieval, to the old. And you'd be like, oh, that's such a, that's so Gothic. Uh, that's a Gothic notion. Um, but you're also, of course, seeing Gothic used in relation to the Gothic tribes and also this sort of almost myth making about the history of Britain and its politics and its influences, sort of tying back um, Britain to sort of that pre-Norman period, pre um, the pre-period before Rome got its claws into England. And you've got this sort of tracing back of an attempted Gothic history as well. So you're getting Gothic becoming quite an overdetermined word in the period. And we'll come back to sort of the idea of Gothic as the medieval and how it becomes sort of central to the start of the, the Gothic novel at least. The Duchess of Malfi is another example of a revenge tragedy this time with references to lycanthropy. But a lot of the themes that you're getting in the Duchess of Malfi are going to be the sort of uh, themes of imprisonment, betrayal, etc., that become such a central feature of the Gothic. So you don't have the Gothic arising out of nowhere. Um, in a sort of more immediate context, you also don't get the Gothic arising out of nowhere. There is some debate about whether Horace Walpole's Castle of Otranto is really the first Gothic novel. It's the first novel that calls itself Gothic, that is certain. But you have other sort of contenders for being within or connected to the genre at the time. So the most famous one is perhaps Longsword Earl of Salisbury, um, which was published in 1762 by Thomas Leyland, an Irish writer. Um, and it is a sort of medieval uh, uh, set sort of history novel, but it holds a lot of the same beats as many of those later Gothic texts. You have persecution, usurpation, you have, uh, you know, an evil villain, you have pursuit, you have castles, you have kid, all of those sort of elements are found in Longsword Earl of Salisbury. And it um, also indicates the way in which the 18th century was becoming sort of interested in this creation of the historical novel. Now, if you've studied uh, sort of more broadly with less detail, sort of the the 18th and early 19th century, we often get told that the historical novel started with Walter Scott, but it, it didn't, um, it did lots of precursors. Um, and this is sort of one of the early ones. Um, we are getting in this period more generally a re-evaluation of the medieval and an interest in it. So really another really key text that we have, again from the 1760s is Her Richard Hurd's Letters on Chivalry and Romance. Um, which talks about these kind of chivalric codes and resuscitates them. So Gothic and the medieval now no longer simply means this age of superstition and darkness um, as it had been being used for, but it's also sort of connected to these ideas of, of chivalry, the passion for arms, the spirit of enterprise, the honour of knighthood and the rewards of valour. And you're getting in the 18th century, you know, the rise of the antiquarian figure, um, you're getting the rise uh, of that sort of first, well, early wave of sort of neo-Gothic architecture. Um, and of course, you're getting the Gothic novel um, in the shape of Horace Walpole's Castle of Otranto. 
And his sort of alleged design in it was, very famously, I've quoted this before, but an attempt to blend the two kinds of romance, the ancient and the modern. In the former, always imagination and probability. In the latter, nature is always intended to be copied with success. So there's a couple of things going on here, but it was an attempt to blend two kinds of romance as in two kinds of fictional production. The ancient, and here he's thinking of sort of, um, you know, the romance sagas so things like the green knight or the arthurian legends tales which were full of imagination and improbability <laughs> full of magic and um stereotypes and quests um and he wants to not only mix that style of literature but also that that world um so he's in the castle of otranto depicting a medieval world um and he's mixing that older style of literature with a newer style, well, say literature, uh, an older style of uh, creative production with a newer style of creative production, the not the modern novel, which is uh, theoretically based on sort of realism <laughs> or attempting to realistically portray people, situations and life. So he's mixing together the styles of literature and he's mixing together as well the sort of time periods in a sense. So you've got the medieval world and then you've got often the speech patterns, sensibilities and psychology of a modern 18th century person. But let's see once again about um, the castle of Otranto. And I mean, I'll go through this quickly because I've talked about it so often, um, but it introduces so many of the features that will become important in the early Gothic. Although as we'll see, I would argue that other texts are perhaps more influential in the way that the Gothic initially went in the 1780s and 90s. Um, so it's a found manuscript and this becomes a really kind of popular technique in the Gothic, this idea that um, it's, it's a text that has been found and translated. So you see this in something like um, the Castle of Otranto where the first edition claimed it was a literal found manuscript and it was only in the second edition where Walpole admitted to his authorship. You find it in things like the Castle of St. Donat's, um, and then you find it obviously in later texts as well, where it's mixed with the epistolary in something like um, Dracula. Um, texts which don't have a found manuscript might, might still have a framing narrative where this is a tale being told. So things like Anne Radcliffe's The Italian is, you know, a priest sort of sharing, a, a tour guide sharing a story of a confession in a church and a murder. Um, in these early texts, we quite often, but far from always, get a Mediterranean setting. Like we talked about yesterday, you have these othered settings. So quite frequently, it's in this sort of quasi-medieval um, European past. Um, you do also have sort of these other locations within Britain, and we'll see a few examples of that. A really sort of uh, solid early example is the castles of Athens and Bain by Anne Radcliffe. We're, we're always told Anne Radcliffe always wrote about Europe, but that's not true. Um, and her first novel was set in a, a very, very nebulous Scotland uh, with just two random castles in the middle of nowhere. Um, the setting is quite often Catholic. And you can see this in a couple of different ways. So a standard critique of the Gothic is that it's anti-Catholic. And if you know me, you know that I am unhappy with the use of the term because I think it's overdetermined. I think it doesn't really tell us what that means and it doesn't help us to place the novels within the context of the toleration debates, which were sort of a really key feature of the late 18th century um, and the extension of toleration to Catholicism, for example. But, um, we do have these Catholic settings. Catholics are often quite negatively depicted, but we also have this idea of, um, in the Gothic, we have contemporary concerns within Britain thrown back on this medieval period, on this older period, and on this uh, sort of distanced Catholic Europe. But the sort of uh, depictions of corrupt Catholic clergy, for example, often encode uh, a broader anti-clericalism or uh, some of the many concerns and complaints about the state of the clergy in the late 18th century, for example. Um, so obviously Horace Walpole introduces the use of the supernatural back into literature, uh, something for which he was derided a little uh, when it became clear that this was his own production. 
and the supernatural does in part sort of at least get toned down and does disappear from some gothic novels after this. Uh, you've got your virtuous heroine as a key figure. Um, oh wait, is that what I actually put there? I can't see because heroines in peril. Yes, you've got heroines in peril running about, uh, fleeing through labyrinthine structures, etc. Um, and the victims of sort of potential economic sexual um, coercion. So there's a returning past that you can't escape. So that becomes obviously a feature later of the ghost story. That's perhaps how we're most uh, familiar with this connection with the Gothic, this trope. But um, you also get quite frequently in the Gothic, the return of a secret or a secret that impacts the future, impacts the now. Um, and in the Castle of Otranto, the returning past is a murder that occurred a couple of generations ago for which the current incumbents are now being punished. Um, another great feature, so glad this was introduced, was the comic servant. Um, so this is uh, a trope that he borrows from Shakespeare very self-consciously. And, you know, he writes about it in his uh, preface that, you know, he's using these servants as comic relief to heighten the extreme emotions of the, you know, the proper people, the, the rich, emotional, sensible people. Um, and the, the, the servants are thrown in to create a sort of sense of bathos at moments, but also to, to heighten the piquancy of the extreme emotions of everybody else. Um, and so this is how you get as a major trope in the Gothic for such a long time, servants having these sort of really banal discussions and being figures of fun uh, within the, the genre, which is oh, definitely not my favourite part. Um, it's also, it starts off, and I, I won't talk about this in great detail, but feel free to ask questions. Um, uh, the sort of tradition within the Gothic of theological critiques being encoded within the Gothic. As I've talked about before in relation to Castle of Otranto, you can read this as a critique uh, more broadly of uh, original sin. How do we get there? Ask me if you'd like to. Um, so next stages are really, I would say, as important in the history of the Gothic as the Castle of Otranto, but we often leap over right to sort of Radcliffe in the 1790s. Um, Sophia Lee's The Recess is a key sort of second stage. This is an alternate history uh, narrative of the 16th century, which tells the story of Mary, Queen of Scots's daughters, who were raised in a recess, um, basically a hidden abbey underneath a house, because if they were known to be alive, they would be potentially killed. They would be the targets of various unscrupulous forces. Um, but the two sisters, you know, demand to be free, end up uh, sort of getting together with two key real historical figures, Essex and, oh, I can't remember the other one, oh my gosh. Um, and it's gone. But two of the sort of key figures from the Elizabethan court. Um, and it all goes terribly wrong. It all goes terribly wrong. Um, it's in an epistolary style, so it introduces some of the tricksy uh, sort of focusing work and unreliable narrator work, which will become such a feature of the Gothic, in that you have both of the sisters testifying at different points, and their accounts of the same events, you realise, don't tie together, and also their accounts of the other's husband are very different from the, the accounts that the, the other sister has given of her own husband. Um, so you have these sort of juxtaposed points of view in certain parts. You also have this trope of the recess or the enclosed space as a space of both entrapment and security for the female characters. And that obviously, um, if you've read later Gothic as well, will become sort of a key motif of depictions um, in the Gothic. So the next one, we mentioned this in the beginning, uh, the Old English Baron, a Gothic story. Um, again, this is a really sort of key development. Um, and it was a very self-conscious interaction with Horace Walpole. Um, it was published originally and limited uh, as a champion of virtue, then changed, published again as the Old English Baron in 1779. And it sought to correct the excesses of Horace Walpole's Castle of the Chanto. Because, you know, it pulls upon the mind and the reason is obvious, the machinery is so violent that it destroys the effect it's intended to create. 
so she's complaining about the excessive use of the supernatural the fact that you know there's not only sort of ghosts but there's skeleton monks massive swords helmets falling out of the sky um and she notes had the story been kept within the utmost verge of probability the effect had been preserved without losing the least circumstance that excites or detains the attention um, so for her, she includes in her story uh, some prophetic dreams, a ghostly apparition, and some also some magically opening doors. But there is a sort of uh, reduction of the amount of the supernatural and um, the motif of keeping with, within the bounds of probability. Now, this can be sort of seen in, in a couple of different ways. And I think, you know, you can definitely link um, Clara Reeves moved to reduce the supernatural and keep it within the bounds of probability to the rise then of the, the explained supernatural and a lot of the later gothic where it's not really supernatural it, it turns out to be you know your mum in the basement or whatever um, but we also see I think its effect on later horror gothic um, or later supernatural gothic texts as well in that um, there was sort of became this emphasis on keeping uh, the supernatural within the bounds, if not of probability of belief, at least within certain depictions and traditions of supernatural belief. So, you know, you might have um, a vampiric figure or you might have a ghost, you might have an avenging poltergeist, but you don't have these excessive creations like the falling helmet. Okay, so moving into the 1790s, I'm differentiating between the terror and the horror gothic rather than the male and female gothic. I don't think, as we talked about, the female and male gothic are particularly helpful. We can ask how helpful it is to talk about the terror and horror gothic, and we'll think about that. Um, remembering our quote on Monday about the fact that, you know, horror gothic novels often deploy techniques of the terror gothic. But we have the terror gothic. This is the, the key example, Mysteries of Udolpho. And if you want to read it in short, read uh, The Veiled Picture. And it's on the reading list. Um, so we've got ruined castles, sublime landscapes, and this emphasis on the sublime and depictions of the sublime and lengthy depictions of the sublime becomes a real sort of feature of the 1790s Gothic and of the terror gothic. Um, an emphasis on travel, interestingly, um, if you think about uh, uh, Ellen Moyers, when in her sort of discussions of the female Gothic, talks about the travelling heroine of Radcliffe. This is a heroine who's not simply confined within the house, but is somebody who is travelling, whether it's fleeing or being coerced across Europe, she's still going on these European wide adventures frequently. Um, the emphasis on not only enclosure, but these kind of tunnels and labyrinthine structures. Um, the introduction of religious institutions, sometimes as places of safety, sometimes as places of persecution. Virtuous heroines who are also, you know, sublime subjects full of poetry and music. And, uh, weeble heroes, <laughs> technical term. Uh, so heroes that are usually heroes of sensibility, um, which means that they are full of extreme emotions. Um, but, and, and sort of sensitivity and empathy, etc. But they're also depicted almost universally as being fairly useless in, in helping the heroine. In Mysteries of Udolpho, for example, while she is kidnapped and held a hostage in a castle where she's threatened by sexual assault and forced marriage, uh, he is drowning his sorrows in Paris, gambling, and uh, basically it's implied having a mistress. So, um, this is quite an extreme example of a hero being completely useless, but it comes up quite a lot in these texts. They're very lovely, very chivalrous, perhaps very sensible in a sort of uh, um, meaning of sensibility, but not very helpful. Um, we're also seeing, you know, obviously the the charismatic villain becoming a key part of these of these texts, um, and we're going to see, obviously, with the Romantic period the rise of the Byronic hero who borrows from these charismatic Gothic heroes and converts him into an anti-hero, which then of course becomes the sort of romantic hero of, of uh, Jane Eyre and the Brontes, that sort of dark hero that's become so influential in the 20th century. Um, the chattering servant still there, the superstitious servant. Um, and these texts focus on a, a comic ending or a happy ending usually. So these are sort of key tropes that you'll find within the terror gothic. 
Um, why am I calling it the terror gothic? Well, because of that distinction that Radcliffe makes between terror and horror, the first expanding the soul and awakening the faculties, the other contracting, freezing and nearly annihilating them. In other words, the terror gothic is really focused on that sense of possibility, curiosity and threat. Um, you know, well, what is it? What is that noise? What is the secret? Whereas the horror gothic is much more focused on uh, confrontation with the horrible and the reveal. Um, other examples of the terror gothic, because we quite often don't talk about them, we think about Radcliffe as sort of starting the terror gothic and being its main proponent. But there were writers who were writing before her and there were writers who were as popular as her, if not more so, at the time. So Charlotte Smith uh, was a poet and a novelist. Uh, she was really influential in the return of the sonnet as a poetic form, just a fun fact there. Um, and Emmeline or Emmeline was written in 1788. It doesn't have these supernatural features, but it does have um, many of these sort of same features of the persecuted, usurped heroine. Um, Children of the Abbey by Regina Marie Roche, the Irish writer, um, is a really interesting novel. It was a massive bestseller for years and years and years and rivaled uh, Radcliffe's sales. Um, and it's the tale of uh, a brother and sister, Oscar and Amanda Fitzalan. Um, so there you go, if Amanda's here, uh, your namesake. Um, <laughs> um, it's uh, a story that happens completely within Ireland, Wales, Scotland and England, so Britain and Ireland, um, and includes sort of quite a lot of forced travel, quite a lot of persecution. There's a, there's a sort of a colonel who's been pursuing her across the the entire country there's a there's a story of usurpation and disinheritance uh, there's murder in the background um there's a there's a mad old lady in a in a in a church random um so you do but you have um the children of the abbey as sort of following quite a lot of the key plot points but it's often used as an example of the non-anti-catholic anti-catholic gothic so it's interesting to me that we talk about the gothic as universally anti-catholic but in order to do so we have to ignore some really key texts from the period that were just as popular as novels like those by radcliffe another example of the pro-catholic i would say in this case uh, gothic is the orphan of the rhine by eleanor sleeth um, which again is set, is set along the Rhine. So um, it's orphans again, and it's a story of persecution and usurpation. Um, and obviously it has a happy ending and a love story at the end, but all of the characters are positively coded Catholics. Um, so it's an interesting sort of antidote to this idea of the universality of anti-Catholicism within, within the genre. Okay, next bit, horror gothic. Um, and, as, and I, as I said, you know, you can debate whether you want to, to think about this as a horror gothic or um, think of it more broadly as a supernatural gothic, or in perhaps you want to deny this attempt to create two sort of key movements within this early British gothic. Um, the monk is obviously sort of the paradigmatic example of this horror gothic. The monk borrows extensively from German and French sources. Um, and, you know, Matthew Lewis had lived on the continent. Um, and it includes um, all of these features that you can see here. Um, and it includes also, um, obviously, the sort of the real supernatural. It includes a negative horror ending, which tends to, to crop up in a lot of these horror gothic texts. It focuses on a sense of warning rather than encouragement and a reward for virtue. But you have, as you can see here, corrupt monks, uh, sort of these key... Uh, a frequent motif of these horror gothic texts is the corruption of uh, monastic institutions. Demonic contracts, uh, demons who are gender fluid, or uh, literally sort of changes between genders, um, uh, theoretically within the text. Um, undead nuns, immortal wanderers, rape, rotting babies, imprisoned nuns, devils. It's got it all, guys. It's got it all. Um, as I've said, there is sort of major influence here from these French and German sources. Um, you have this, this is an example, the Memoir de Châtenin is an example of the sort of anti-clerical pornographic propaganda. 
And this idea of the monasteries and uh, convents as places of sort of salacious sexual sin and also of persecution was sort of key to these kind of anti-clerical narratives. Um, you also have sort of the influence of German texts. I've, I've put this one up because there was a translation of the Necromancer, um, Peter Tutold, um, and you can see here a sort of very clear example, not only of influence, but of the way in which German texts were being translated into English and disseminated. So you can see the cross currents between them and these sort of German texts were bringing in a much sort of strong emphasis on the horror, on horror and the horrific. Um, so key tropes that you'll find within uh, the, the horror gothic more broadly is uh, a real emphasis on the Inquisition that occurs in the terror gothic as well. Uh, a slight sort of change will be um, the emphasis on the processes of the Inquisition and a focus on, for example, the tortures of the Inquisition. You have monastic and conventional depravity or torture, again, a feature of the terror gothic. But instead of being a sort of more muted persecution, it becomes a detailed um, laying out of, for example, in the abbess, um, you have uh, graphic scenes of torture. In uh, Melmoth the Wanderer, you have graphic scenes of torture. Um, necromancy, ghosts, a key, demonic pacts and secret societies. That secret society is a real sort of key part of the German Gothic. And you'll see it in, um, in it sort of many of the texts that are either influenced by the German or translated from the German. Uh, robber bands and groups like that sort of um, drawing from the Sturm und Drang and particularly sort of the narrative of the robbers by Schiller, and these kind of robber bands um, persecuting the countryside. Um, and murder most foul, obviously, lots of murders. So some examples of the horror gothic, um, you've got The Monk by Matthew Lewis that we've already talked about, The Horrid Mysteries, uh, is one that focuses on secret societies. It's very weird. Um, the narrative order is very peculiar. The Floya is a female uh, written example uh, of the, the horror gothic, and you might be familiar with it. It's a great read. It's an interesting read. Um, it's a very similar sort of narrative journey to the monk um, of sort of dissolution and, and descent into further and further crimes. Zastrozzi by Percy Shelley. Is another example of the horror gothic, as you can see, concentrates on imprisonment. And Melmoth the Wanderer by Charles Maturin is a man who sold his soul to the devil for knowledge and 150 extra years of life, who is trying to find somebody else to take over the deal. So he goes around um, finding people in the worst of possible circumstances and offering them the chance to swap places with him and to escape the Inquisition, for example. But everybody always says no. So rounding up a little bit, um, if we're thinking about the 18th century Gothic, it's worth noting sort of the publishing um, and how this was occurring and how we have such a sort of meteoric rise in the novel in this period. Who was reading it? How was it being disseminated? And uh, was this really sort of part of a widening of, of um, sort of the literary sphere and you know, an extension of reading more broadly? Um, well, yes, basically. Um, we shouldn't sort of take uh, too seriously the idea that was often sort of said that this was a servant's genre of literature. Um, this was read widely across different social classes. And obviously, uh, those from lower class backgrounds didn't have the sort of necessary access or money to, to read many of the longer Gothic novels. But we do see sort of the production of um, Penny Dreadful's Blue Books chat books as being for a slightly uh, more working class audience. But um, the Minerva Press is sort of the key press that people know. It's certainly not the only press producing gothics, but it was churning them out something awful. Um, it was set up by William Lane and ran from approximately 1720 to 18, uh, 1790 to 1820. So you can see sort of the end of the Minerva Press is also a key date for the sort of fall of the gothic. Um, it was not only a press, but connected to a circulating library. And these circulating libraries were sort of a key part of the dissemination of these texts to people from different um, backgrounds as well. Um, and you have a stable of regular authors who are producing books for the Minerva Press and many anonymous authors, often producing works of slightly lower quality, but not necessarily. Um, 
You also have sort of um, in terms of the dissemination to a wider audience, you have the chat books, you have blue books, chat books. Now, some of these were original productions. Some of them, some of them were borrowing borrowings from sort of larger texts which would take a particular incident so from the monk by matthew lewis the incident of the bandits was very popular to take out um or they might be a sort of a, an edited version if you will a short version of um a pre-existing gothic so the veiled picture or the mysteries of gorgono is the mysteries of udolpho in short basically so it's i often read it when i'm teaching as a reminder of the basic plot when I don't have time to read 600 pages. Um, Gothic drama uh, was also sort of a key part of uh, what was going on in the 1790s. Again, you have the adaptation of existing books. So The Romance of the Forest um, by Anne Radcliffe was adapted into Fontainville Forest. There is a tendency in moving into um, the theatre to move more towards the real supernatural and these kind of very elaborate um ghosts and supernatural apparitions were really part of the draw to gothic cinema you also have original works from sort of closet works like the mysterious mother so closet works are works that were never performed the mysterious mother is a tale of incest so it's a mother who has sex with her son um, and they have a daughter and then he returns home after being kind of exiled for a while he doesn't know that this has happened and he falls in love with his own daughter slash sister so Nightmare. It all ends badly, obviously. Um, Venoni, again, is a tale of persecution in a monastery. Um, and uh, Bertram by Charles Maturin uh, is a tale of sort of, well, there's ghosts and horror. There's all sorts going on in these texts. And they tend to be that little bit more extreme, that little bit more uh, sort of, if not salacious, then certainly on the horror spectrum in terms of what boundaries they're willing to push. Now, we've talked about the two main streams, but it's important, I think, to note in the 18th century Gothic, there's a lot more going on um, than just these two main streams. And we tend to, when talking about the early British Gothic, really limit what it contained to a very narrow conception of both what it was and what it was doing. So I mentioned in the Terra Gothic, you know, our emphasis on anti-Catholicism can only occur if we just get rid of uh, quite a few of the really important texts from the period. Um, the idea that there was a terror and horror gothic and that we can delineate that really clearly slightly falls apart when we look at these other forms of the gothic which were arising and which mix different characteristics. So um, in Mary Wollstonecraft's Mariah or the Wrongs of Women, for example, it's extremely horrifying, but there's not a hint of the supernatural. So um, some other sort of gothics from the period, we have the rise, uh, sort of the cross section with Orientalism that we find in William Beckford's Vathek, um, which is, um, as you can see from, from the depiction there, it's based on a sort of very, very broadly Islamic um, world and includes uh, as a sort of, I, what is his position, a caliph maybe, I'm not sure, who is um, basically making demonic deals um, and ends up in Eblis. Uh, Mariah Wollston, Mary Wollstonecraft's Mariah um, is a tale which is about a woman who's been entrapped in an asylum by her husband. Um, it's set in the modern day and so Mary Wollstonecraft directly interacts with this idea of okay well write your coding stuff into the gothic you're coding the persecution of women into these texts set in the medieval period but I'm just going to pop it right on the page like what is really horrifying is what men can do to women right now legally um, you also have the philosophical gothic. Um, a key component uh, proponent of this is obviously William Godwin. And I've talked about some of these texts before. Caleb Williams um, is a man who discovers his master's secret and then is persecuted across the ages. It's a reflection, it sort of ties in uh, with uh, William Godwin's inquiry into political justice and is really a takedown of the legal system within Britain. So Leon by William Godwin um, is about a man who achieves immortality and there's a lot of discussion of sort of material determinism. And Mandeville by William Godwin, my favourite, um, is about a uh, sort of a Presbyterian figure. Um, 
and I won't spoil it by telling you what it's all about, but it's one of my favourites because it's from a villain's point of view. Um, you also have the Gothic of theological perversion. So at the beginning, people were saying, you know, was the, was the Scottish and the uh, American Gothic really influencing the, the British at this point? Well, the English, because obviously the Scottish is part of that the hold all term of British. Um, not really, not in the sort of the very early stages, uh, rather sort of the opposite in, in a sense particularly with, with America. But you have the start of the American Gothic. We can date it back to the 18th century with Charles Brogdon Brown and something like Wheel and Other Transformation, which is a novel of uh, a bioquist or a ventriloquist who casts his voice uh, to sort of deceive the main character who then uh, goes on to believe that he's being controlled by a divine voice, which leads him to kill his family. Uh, Private Memoirs and Confessions of a Justified Sinner is part of that Scottish Gothic tradition, which is really involved in a critique of uh, extreme Calvinist theology and takes it to its uh, sort of logical extent. We've already talked about sort of the Scottish Gothic quite a lot recently, and we've just read this in book group, obviously, but it's the story of a man who, um, when uh, he believes in his own election, when he believes that he's saved, starts to be visited by a devil who slowly begins to sort of take over his life and leads to further and further crimes. Um, we've also talked about, you know, at the beginning, I said I was going to mention Gothic parody and it becomes a really key part of the genre. Um, by the 1790s, there are lots of sort of parodies of the Gothic or parodic interactions with the Gothic and satiric interactions with the Gothic occurring in the popular press. So you have caricatures, like uh, this Tales of Wonder. You have these women sitting around listening to scary stories. Um, you have pieces of writing, like I put on the reading list of the, ter the terrorist um, way of writing. So, um, you know, the Gothic has become a subject of parody, of satire, of mockery to some extent. And you do get texts right from the 1790s that are producing Gothic parodies. So the history, the Castle of St. Arnold's or the history of Jack Smith, is a loving parody, I would say, um, but picks apart some of the um, more foolish elements of the Gothic. So the hero, for example, is somebody who makes all of the mistakes of somebody like a Valancourt, but has to actually go through a, a lengthy learning process to um, become a better person rather than just crying about it. Um, and also you have uh, parodies of individual novels. So St. Leon, which I talked about, has a parody by Edmund Dubois, which is St. Godwin, a tale. And it's really funny. Um, it's one of my favorites. Um, Gothic parody um, can do two things, broadly speaking, um, or it does two things, broadly speaking. It quite frequently uncovers a Gothic world, um, as we see in something like Northanger Abbey. And I've talked about this enough times before that I'm sure everybody knows, but Northanger Abbey um, is a, a romance, really, but it's Catherine um, is a big reader of the Gothic, interprets everything through her Gothic novels, and so misinterprets everything. But does she? She thinks that her beloved's father is probably a murderer, but it turns out, of course, not a murderer, but yes, um, a neglectful abuser. Um, we also get sort of more straight up mockeries of, um, of the Gothic or of Gothic worldviews in things like Thomas Love Peacock's Nightmare Abbey, which is sort of a gothicized parody of the romantics. Um, and it's a, a castle where they're all gathered together, an abbey where they're all gathered together, um, sitting around having pointless conversations and making terrible mistakes in love. So this has been a real trot through the gothic but hopefully um you know it's been useful um we have it sort of right at the end um increasingly in the 19th century of course we're getting cross-pollination between the romantics and the gothic and we really see that in these kind of key texts that are coming out at the end of that period of the early british gothic um the vampire um by uh, william polidori which is a sort of satire, I think, of the Byronic anti-hero in vampire form. And you're also getting texts like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which is a work of sort of gothic science fiction, 
um, which is interacting with critiquing and developing the sort of philosophical ideas central to and investigated within Romanticism. And sort of this is the future of the genre, this cross pollination between the Romantic and uh, the Gothic. Although we see sort of the fall of the Gothic in this period, this has produced the seeds of what will later develop and become sort of really key even to our modern understanding of the Gothic. So these are the questions that I will leave us with today if people want to interact with them, but you don't have to. Um, to those of you at home, um, I hope that uh, you feel free to answer these questions in the chat or contact me on Twitter at RomgothSam. So which of any of the previous information was most surprising? Does it change or modify your understanding of the early British Gothic? Which of these early forms of the Gothic has had the longest or most important legacy, do you think? And to what extent do terms like the terror and horror Gothic or the male or female Gothic help us in navigating the early period? Which books are you most eager to read? Because of course, you're eager to read at least one of them, right?